please. And I'm going to go back to the screen sharing, sorry. The joys of technology, there we go. So it is um, my great pleasure to be here. As I told you, um, this is the second time I've given this slideshow. So that's my disclaimer on the philosophical note. The, the other practical note is, is that we went out for Ethiopian last night and it tasted really good going down, but I'm still suffering today. So it could be a, rumpy, uh, a bumpy road. At any rate, we are here and we're going to talk about a very important story that basically no one knows about. This is the story, as we'll find out, of America's greatest grassroots response to the Holocaust as it was happening. But the story is nuanced, it's complicated. We're going to just start it. Um, this is actually the top half of my book, printed in 1996. You see some of the rub marks on the cover. Out of Hitler's Reach, the Scattergood Hostel for European Refugees, 1939 to 43. All right. This. Or just the interrupt the corner. Yeah, For the 1939 residents of West Branch, Iowa, this gravel lane served as the main route into town. But to European refugees trying to escape Hitler's tyranny, the dusty Iowa road was a path to safety. Basically, we're talking about Schindler's List and the Prairie. The only difference is, is that everyone in the world knows about Oscar Schindler and the 1100 Jews who stayed in New Europe. Almost no one knows about the 185 refugees that Iowa played the farm with college kids stayed. From 1939 to 1943, nearly 200 refugees from Nazi-occupied Europe found a safe haven at Scattergood Hostel, a makeshift commune on the site of what had been a Quaker boarding school. Here, outside the small town of West Branch, Iowa Quakers hosted Jews as well as Hitler's political dissidents, offering them food, shelter, and a glimmer of light in the midst of Nazi darkness. Admittedly, 185 is a drop well, it's not even a drop in the bucket compared to six million people who perished at Auschwitz and Tripoli and all the other death camps. But 185 souls saved was more than what was being saved on the road. I mean, this story is a story, a remarkable story of Iowa Quaker farmers and college students who had no connection with these people, had no obligation, and in many cases couldn't even correctly pronounce their names, but brought them over from Berlin and Prague and Vienna and Budapest and saved their lives. If the Quakers had not saved them, they would have all been killed at Auschwitz and gone up the chimney as ashes. But because of the bravery of some people, their lives were saved. People pretty much like you, actually. For author Michael Wood trains, the Scattergood story is an example of goodness during the time of hatred. A rarity in world history, he feels compelled to share with everybody he can, from Quaker congregations to these Des Moines High School students. If you were a refugee, where would you go? Where would you find help? Who would help you? Most people don't do anything in most uh, areas of their lives to actively, ongoingly help someone else. You know, life is hard as it is. We don't want to be responsible, feel responsible for somebody else. So we turn the other way. So during the Third Reich, most people ignored these peoples who were trying to scurry out of harm's way. What's amazing is that the Iowa Quakers didn't like with getting to know a person, the more that you get to know about Scattergood Hostel, the more you realize this is exciting, this is life changing. If I involve myself in this, if I invest my, my heart, not just my head, but my heart in the story, it will change me. 
For Michael, pictures of Scatterhood offer a glimpse into just how unique the hostel really was. In fact, you swear these to be snapshots of a peaceful family farm rather than images of a wartime refugee camp. Unlike most service agencies, which offered limited assistance during business hours only, Scattergood operated as a full-time commune, with each refugee staying an average of four months. Here, Quakers and Jews not only shared field work and daily chores, but also the tremendous burden of war's impact. Some of the people had been through great trauma. Some had no hunger. And it, and some of them in Dachau. Another refugee would come down to the pantry at night, steal lard, give you know, in severe hunger a camp, just be lard, regain weight to satisfy his hunger. But by that point, hunger probably wasn't just physiological, it's also psychological. Some of the refugees arrived with children or spouses still back in Europe. Some of them would pace the hallway at night and they couldn't sleep back and forth, back and forth. None of these 49 volunteers had had any training. They didn't know what post-traumatic syndrome was. They hadn't been instructed in psychology or counseling. And yet they came and gave what they had the most of, which was vitality and enthusiasm, idealism, and love. On a practical level, that love meant, I'm going to listen to your story, even when I'm tired, when I have five other things distracting me. Love means that when you're hurting, I'm strong enough to ask you what you're hurting about. And we're well, really this is the answer. There's something that all of us could do to help out the life of someone. While Quaker representatives in Europe helped refugees secure immediate needs like visas and passage money, Iowa Quakers, with their modest resources, channeled efforts into long reaching acts of human kindness, opening their homes to the war torn Europeans whose heroin escapes have led them to the United States. In addition to therapeutic social activities, the Scattergood staff provided health care, language classes, and job training, hoping to give refugees, or guests as they were called, a foundation on which to rebuild their lives. They wanted these tattered and tired people to feel that they were worthy of respect, even if they learned fabulous English and they could work wonders with a hammer and saw, if the people had not found their own centers, if they had not rediscovered themselves while well, scattered, but all the practical training in the world would not have made a great difference. When you're under that much attack, under that much stress, I think your soul goes on vacation. You have to vacate your life, your biography, your body just to survive. At Scattered Hospital, uh, people's souls, people's spirits could rejoin their bodies, the biographies, people could rest. Quake is intended as a place to be where people could regather themselves, and indeed that's what happened. Of the 23 children who passed through Scatterhood, all but three became either teachers, psychologists, or social workers, each demonstrating a desire to share the goodness found on the Iowa prairie. For the young guests, Scatterhood was an introduction to Midwestern truths, like marshmallows and honey bars. But for 15 year old Gunter Krautheim, it was also a long awaited return to serenity. I think it was a, uh, it was a, it was a frightening situation. I knew I wasn't going to, I couldn't live in Germany. Uh, but you know, the way you look back up, so you could have this, uh, this uncertainty. You know, you went to good school, you know, the way you went to go up, you didn't know what's going to happen. Everything is always temporary. You don't know what to expect. Uh, you don't make any plans. You don't quite make any plans because it's just too unpredictable. And you get a huge impression of it. Very huge impression. And in retrospect, it sort of means as a safe haven. I just need the first one in my whole life. And I have. And of course, when I came here, that was back in 1942. And maybe some of your grandparents were at Quaker School here at that time. In May of 1998, Gunter, or George as he's now called, returned to West Branch for the first time in over 50 years, oh, okay. responding to letters from these middle school students who were studying Scatterhood as part of their Holocaust unit. So we had to sort of sneak out of the country, uh, like, you know, like, so 
back weeks and you know going on some barbed wire to help with somebody who the guy was across the border. And I was very scared, I'll tell you. As a child in Hitler's Germany, this New Jersey professor of neuroscience tried to accept hardships as adventures, even attempting to view his dangerous escape into Belgium as a journey into a new land. But despite his self-proclaimed optimism, the complexities of having a German Christian mother and a Jewish father were often too overwhelming to comprehend. They were all marched to the edge of town. Most of them were shot in other prisoners. Teddy Clark in short the concentration camp. You know, he was like a bit killed by a German uncle. I think he survived the war. I think it was important. Anybody who's looking for truth, you know, I think, to know about it and to realize that such things can have happened and in a sense still happen in other places. And it actualizes so important. After class, a handful of students accompanied George on a visit to Scatterford which has today returned to a Quaker boarding school. While most of the hostel's original buildings are long gone, the ground still holds some of George's fondest memories, like the tree under which the 15-year-old refugee spent Iowa's hot summer nights, and the echoing spirit of the Quakers who forever changed his life. Sometimes I can't put it into words, but it must have been I thought about it where I go. Whatever it was, it was just a very unique, uh, powerful experience that changed my life. <clears throat> In the beginning, Scatter Good was created to counter the tragedies of racism, but ironically, it was racism itself that brought the hospital to a close. In later years, as the war in Europe escalated, it became nearly impossible for European refugees to find safe passage to Scattergood. The Iowa Quakers then turned their attention to Japanese Americans who had been forced into relocation camps. However, the West Ranch residents, who had once embraced European refugees, now vehemently refused to accept Japanese Americans into their town. Unable to fight the town's protests, the Quakers were forced to close the hostel bringing Scatterhood's four-year path of life to a dark end. The PBS featurette that you saw is, besides being 25 years old, that was, by the way, the Good Twin, I'm the other one. Um, it was the Oprah Winfrey version of the story. Um, everything in that film was absolutely true. There's nothing that I would say as the leading historian about Scattergood that it was inaccurate or exaggerated, but it was also only part of the truth. And tonight, uh, two of my objectives are, is to tell you the story as a social historian, and then later as someone who's struggling with this whole a woke dynamic, and we'll come to that as well. Just truth in advertising, I happened to be a Quaker. I became one when I was 17. And meaning is a difficult word. So like freedom or love, meaning has many meanings. One of them is literally to come together, but we Quakers don't go to church, they go to meeting. And so it's sort of a double entendre there. Oh, sorry.
from a meeting house is essentially a church, right? Kind of. Quakers would desist that, but <laughs> yes, it's where we meet. If I'm going too fast, you should tell me that I'm advancing it too, too quickly. And again, these are the actual quotes from the 1940 pamphlet. And it was my decision when Demetri, our webmaster, and I decided to do this, that it wouldn't be me doing the speaking here, but rather it was the um, Quaker's own pamphlet. Again, if I'm going too fast, tell me I'm new at this myself. So what's happening here? There are two things going on. One is that um, we should always ask the context. Why would these Iowa Quakers bring these refugees from far across the planet, no uh, freeways or what in Germany is called Autobahn in the United States, no jet engines? This was a very improbable project. So why were the Quakers doing this? And part of the answer is, is that they had practice with the freedmen, a term we wouldn't probably use today, but recently, liberated enslaved people. So they had worked with refugees, if you will. And there's a background. So not only were the Quakers in Iowa, recently in living memory um, involved with helping the refugees from the south but also before the civil war scattergood um, was near west branch west branch was a station on the underground railroad i'm assuming that almost everyone here is conversant what that is and what it was about and so the quakers also in west branch but throughout the midwest and the northeast were literally helping people flee through the underground, hiding African-Americans in their cellars and their hay mows. Sometimes there are famous stories in the back of their wagons underneath uh, bales of um, wool and harvest things and being apprehended by fugitive slave uh, hunters and being asked, what do you have here? And saying wool and meat, because they couldn't say, well, we actually have runaway slaves, could they? About the same time that Iowa Quakers were involved with the Mm, alleviating of African-Americans suffering after the Civil War, they were also involved with the so-called Indian School Project. We know by looking at the faces of these young Native youth that not everyone's having a good time, but the Quakers thought that they were doing the right thing. Um, they saw that out on the prairie there were these Native peoples who were being dispossessed from their land, and they thought the best thing to do is help them integrate into the new um, scheme, which is white settlement. Long before that, Quakers were involved, like this Eliz um, Elizabeth Fry, a British friend, in penal reform. You, in fact, the word penitentiary comes from the Quakers to do penance. So you have to re remember that when the Quakers themselves were being persecuted in Britain in the early 1600s, they were being thrown into pits, and thrown into collective uh, jails with the, with the rest. So men, women, rats, moldy bread, mud, it was cold and they were just thrown in. Often the British Crown was siphoning that off, sending people to Australia, even to Canada, um, the Caribbean. At any rate, the Quakers said, no, no, you can't do that. It is disrespectful of people's humanity. You have to give them a chance to reflect on their crimes and what they could do better in the future. And they should do some penance at a penitentiary and then go back out in the world and do better. Of course, we know that that's not quite always the way it works. So the modern penitentiary system was actually a Quaker invention. And preceding that, Quakers, of course, were very involved with women's rights and, and none of us stand alone in our social activities, but we all stand on the shoulders of the giants who went before us, even Susan B. Anthony, for whom I think there's now a dollar in the United States, a Susan Anthony dollar, Elizabeth Caddy Stanton, Grimke sisters, they were all doing the work of earlier Quakers. For example, this woman, who I think many of you have also heard of, 
of course, it was Lucretia Mott. That little rectangle is the bane of my existence tonight. I'm <laughs> pushing it around the screen. So she had actually attended nine partner boarding school in Dutchess County, New York. It was the second largest settlement of Quakers outside of the Philadelphia region. Um, and not only was she later a teacher, but she met her former, a future husband there. And Quakers were always emphasizing education, including right from the get-go of girls and women and people of color. You go back to the early days of Quakerism, here's a London yearly meeting, um, women are speaking. And this is about 1680 or 1720, I guess, when the costumes uh, of the men who don't seem to be Quakers, maybe they're visiting or gawking. At any rate, notice the women are already speaking. I don't think if you went down the street to the local Anglican church or the Catholic church or the synagogue, or if there was a mosque then, which I doubt, I don't think there would have been many women being very active in those secular congregations. So we're at the early days of Quakerism. One of the founders, George Fox, right away from the get-go said, we believe there's something sacred in every person. The Quakers call out the inner light, um, the Christ within, um, the spirit, whatever you want to name it yourself. And because there's something sacred in every person, regardless of their skin color or their origins, you have to treat them with decency. That if you go to war, if you kill people, you're literally extinguishing something of God or of the divine. And that's why Quakers from the early days said, we will be pacifists, we will not fight in wars, and we will speak against injustice to those who are discriminated against. This is a Quaker peace testimony in the 1660s. And that vision led the Quaker, the newly convinced friend William Penn to come to the Delaware uh, Valley and try his holy experiment um, and establish a peaceable kingdom on earth um, as opposed to the other colonies, the Quakers actually paid the natives for the land. I'm sure it was a pittance, but still they made the gesture. So out of this long tradition of social activism coming out of their faith, uh, their faith, friends soon felt And this was key. So the school had operated for 41 years. And for the reasons you just saw, the school was then discontinued. And there came the idea of this hostel. To find out how that idea really came into being. We have to go to Clear Lake, Iowa, where it happens to be I'm from. I went to high school basically where the E is of Clear Lake and went to church where the L is and drank many cherry phosphates where the R is in Clear Lake. There are already a, a few important notes to make right here. So Eleanor Roosevelt was conversant with Quaker speak, sort of so speak. And this is her visit to West Town Friends School, west of Philadelphia. She knew Clarence Pickett, who had been a teacher at a Quaker school, as I have also been. And then he was appointed the secretary of the American Friends Service Committee. This is key. The American Friends Service Committee had arisen in 1917 as a way to find some alternative service for young Quaker, but also I think they brought in a few other faiths, maybe Mennonites or Brethren, maybe Unitarians, a way to do alternative service 
as opposed to killing. So instead of having a gun in their hands, they were on the battlefield, but carrying the stretchers for the ambulance and doing um, medical work. Clarence Pickett. So virtually all Quakers in the US in those days were conscientious objectors? Theoretically, yes, there were exceptions. During the Civil War, there were some Quaker brothers or who had broken away and supported John Brown, Harpers Ferry, but those were exceptions. Okay, so most Quakers in World War II were granted conscientious objector status. Yes, they, it didn't mean they didn't have to work for it because they all had to. Um, a, a note also about um, Clarence Pickett, not only being a fellow Midwestern of mine, and he was educated at Quaker College in Iowa, William Penn and Oskaloosa, where some white people have lived, but he was seen as too radical to be a school teacher, and he found his perfect place at the American Friends Service Committee, and it was he who took this 1917 uh, conceptualized project and made it a global effort. So literally, the AFSC grew under his um, guidance to literally being active in most of the seven continents. And for such work, the American Friends Service Committee and the British Friends um, Service, I think it was called, they jointly were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1947. I don't have the pictures in yet, but I want to put in a picture of Martin Luther King Jr. and um, uh, Baton Rustin. He was an African-American gay Quaker from Philadelphia. He actually was a sidekick of Martin Luther King Jr.'s. He was at the uh, event in 1963 at the Memorial down the mall. And it was actually um, Bayard Rustin who got the FSC to give him the money to go to India. It was the FSC, it was Quaker money that helped Martin Luther King Jr. go and fall in love with Gandhi in India. And Martin Luther King Jr. spoke often at Quaker conferences at uh, Cape, Cape May, is that what it's called in New Jersey? New Jersey yeah. yeah, so Martin Luther King Jr. also knew the Quakers quite well, but I'm getting ahead of the story. So I want to go back to Clear Lake. Um, a footnote. So what you have here are a couple of things going on. You've got young Iowa Quaker, mostly farm kids, gathering in the summer. It can be really hot in Iowa in the summer. I know it's subtropical. So they were languishing around, being slow and talking to each other during the day, going swimming. In fact, I think I cut my foot on one of those rocks right there off that dock. Um, my mother and I also attended that same uh, Methodist church camp when we were young in the 40s and me in the 60s and 70s. So by night, they'd have a campfire, they would sing. And it was here in their conversations, especially during their plenaries, that they said, you know, this fellow in Hitler is not doing um, good things for the Jews. He, he doesn't mean them well. Um, we could do something. And it was then that the young Quakers said, well, we have this uh, abandoned school. We could bring all these refugees from New York, which was already being called, the Upper West Side was being called the Fourth Reich because of all the Jewish and other German refugees. So they said, we could bring these people out to Iowa to scatter good school, and we could do projects. We could do activities to help them in the summer. Back to our story. So by coincidence, this was a perfect storm of something happening. Um, Clarence Pickett and his wife, Lily, took their daughters, Rachel and Carolyn, to Nazi Germany in 1938. In fact, the, um, the Pickett's had been, the, the, the couple had been to Germany in 1934 on fact-finding delegation trips. I don't know if the two girls were in 1934, but they were certainly um, present during the 1938 trip. Now, in those days, you can imagine that some of your parents or grandparents took ships to Europe in that period. You had to plan that quite a ways out. It was a week trips um, on the ocean to get to get there in the first place. And then you had to have a week back. They went for six weeks plus the week either side. So they were gone for two months. It's a huge undertaking. You just didn't sort of zip over to Germany. So the pickets have planned this well out in advance. And what happened by coincidence, and we'll be talking later about other coincidences, they arrived on September, I think, 13th. Four days later, Chamberlain and Dadier came to Berlin or wherever, they, Munich, sorry, Munich, you're stomping around. And they negotiated, actually not, they appeased and we see what happened. So it's really interesting. And so if you go to our website, I can, I actually could do that. Um, if you go to our website, yep, I can show you later where it is. We actually have the reports 
both from 1934 and the 12-page re report from 1938, where the pickets are going around Hamburg, Berlin, they go to Denmark briefly, they actually go to Sudetenland, and they're writing in their um, report things like this. Oops. Sorry. Again, briefly, so we'll come back to this, but notice that Pickett comments on the, the lay of the land between Hamburg and Berlin, and he talks about its agricultural value. And then he says, and by the way, we see all these uh, tanks and guns and soldiers running around. And then when they went to the Sudetenland, and then I think they went all the way to Prague, it was very clear, it's very tense. The trains were full of young soldiers and um, war material going to the Sudetenland. Back in the Midwest, um, the representative meeting is, is also important because the Quakers had actually split about the 1870s along theological lines. And today you have Quakers who are more like Methodists or perhaps Baptists, and they have sermons with a little bit of silence Whereas the um, conservative friends, those who preserve the old ways, they sit in silence. That's the part of Quakers that I'm part of. So this was the first time that both groups came together 50 years after this divide. And they said, okay, we, they were called them progressive friends. Now we call them Friends United Meeting, um, the program friends. They said, we will go home and we'll go through our uh, cupboards and our closets and our buffets. We will bring bed linen and extra bowls and pots and pans and some brought um, orphaned lambs or bushels of apples from last year's harvest. And they said, we will outfit sort of to make it a comfortable home. And the conservative friends, those who are, we call today unprogrammed, they said, we will rent the facility for a dollar a year to the FSC, which also of course is a liability issue, but together these two groups agreed and the hostel began to take shape. So imagine Clarence Pickett returns in October. I don't really want to go backwards, but you might have noticed that that letter, the report, he labeled it confidential. It was approved and put in the archives on November 8th, 1938. So you know what happened in September of 38, um, the Western allies basically played dead and, and um, let Hitler have his way. But what happened on November 9th? Kristallnacht what we called it, although German academics don't like to call it that anymore. So literally, the day after that Pickett's report is stamped and put in the file, there's another reason. And so it's a perfect storm. The FSC Quakers who've been looking for a place say, oh, there's this letter on our desk that came while you were gone from the young Quakers in, in Iowa. Boom, the idea of the hostel was born. These are Jews, I think, from Würzburg being um, rounded up and sent to the trains and then sent off most of them to their deaths in Auschwitz. Can anyone take a stab at this? Why is it important that this site was away from the North Those are the words from the original report. 1940. And I'm sorry, the glass case is in the way. It says problems of, of employment and assimilation. So any idea why this was important that it was away from the East Coast? I was 12 before I met a black person and a brown person. I was. 16 before I saw a mountain or 18 before I saw the ocean, 20 before I met a Jew. This was not atypical. So we in the Midwest, the rural Midwest, we didn't have hardly any Jewish people or African-Americans or any, anybody that wasn't looking like us. And so we didn't have flaming anti-Semitism because when those people are not present, it's hard to get some value out of a joke or some slur against them. Whereas in the Northeast, in New York, Boston, Philadelphia, God forbid, not Washington, of course. But you know, here, 
anti-Semitism was rampant. It was healthily in, in, uh, in effect. Plus you had the problems of all these recent refugees and immigrants. And so people were allergic to the idea of bringing these refugees here. So the FSC said, we'll send them further. Take care of that problem. And then this footnote, which needs to be made, and I hope you'll, you'll be generous and go with me on this. So you have to imagine what it was like for our grandparents and great grandparents. In the 1930s, mm, every third American had no job or was underemployed. In some regions, Gary, um, Biden's hometown, Scranton, um, Pittsburgh, every third American had no job. So times are tough. Also in Europe. So agricultural culture was seen as a viable option. There were back to the land movements in the 20s, again in the 30s, in the 50s and the 70s, I was even part of that. So the idea was industrial culture is bankrupt, capitalism is bankrupt, um, so we need to go back to the land. We need to be self-reliant, have a cow, chickens. And so also they said the Jews, in Germany anyway, Jews were not allowed to practice, you know this, law, medicine, et cetera, and Zionism had them all hopped up to go to Israel, if possible, what we know as Israel and Palestine, and they would have to have agricultural skills to make the desert bloom. Plus, the Nazis had said, and maybe seriously, well, Madagascar would make a nice Jewish colony. We'll send the Jews to Madagascar. And the Jews themselves had projects in Dominican Republic. So Jews were going to the Caribbean and they had farm projects. You know, the Jews had other, um, in the weekends, even Jews that stayed in the Third Reich that hadn't been yet deported, um, they'd send their youth on the weekends, not only biking through Brandenburg, but they would do agricultural gardening projects. They were practicing for emigration, especially if they couldn't practice the professions. So this was a possibility, it was a reality. This is from one of those brochures, by the way. I interviewed 40 of these people in the 1990s, and one of the women said that when her parents were informed that the Quakers were sent to Iowa, they burst into tears and they were sure there'd be Indians and giraffes outside. Um, <laughs> but there, there are no giraffes in Iowa, I can tell you that. Go back for a second. So what is that particular point of view? And which problems? You saw the people being marched down the street in Woodsburg to the trains. How do you cope with that problem? That's a problem. How do you address that problem? Quietly with understanding and openness and saying, welcome, how can we help you? Okay. So the Quaker idea was hopefully helpful template for all this. Some of the people I interviewed said, the Stanleys look like American Gothic. It's just missing the pitchfork. <laughs> so literally, the Stanleys were helping to set the clock again to get time moving, and the school was now a hostel. A footnote, and I will try to do this later um, more than now. Martha Balderston, the third director, her husband, Robert Balderston, was where? In Rotterdam. And he was at the dock when the SS Lewis came back from Cuba because the Cubans, right as the shipment of 1,100 Jews got to the harbor of Havana, said, well, actually, those visas we gave you, we didn't really mean them. We don't want the Jews here. So the captain had to turn the, the ship around, went up the coast of Florida. You could see Miami lights and probably the Art Deco um, hotels in the distance. No, the nation's will didn't change. So the, the captain took them further towards Washington, New York, and was hoping that Eleanor could, could soften um, Franklin's heart here in your city didn't happen. And so her husband, 
who was doing refugee relief work in, in Europe, he was there as these 1100 mostly Jews got off the ship and they might as well just gotten off the gangplank um, into trains for Auschwitz because most of them ended up there anyway. And he watched that and wrote to his wife at Scattergood and said, it's one of the saddest days of my life to watch these 1100 dejected people get off the ships. We can guess what's gonna to happen to them. At the moment, you're seeing staff, little Camilla Houston graduated early from Roosevelt High School in Des Moines. She was 16. She came for um, six months and stayed for a year and a half for going to college. Mildred Holmes, again, later, um, Hannah Arndt said that evil is banal, well, so is goodness. Um, Mildred Holmes, by coincidence, after she left the hostel, married a Quaker who had been in Nazi Germany trying to um, at, um, reach out to the needs of these refugees. And when Pearl Harbor was bombed, he happened to be there and he was interned with 2,000 other Americans in Baden-Baden, in Baden-Nauheim, which is in the Taunus Mountains above Frankfurt. And he, anyway, he was at the camp in Baden-Baden. And after he was released, actually maybe in the q and I'll tell you the true story, he was traded for um, American-held Germans. He later married Mildred Holmes. So how ironic that she's a staff at the hostel and then she leaves and marries this man who had been an intern, uh, in, civilian intern in Nazi Germany. In, in Turney, I'm sorry. Ski instructor, Austrian Frank Schloss was there. Lillian George later married and were lifelong Quaker activists in the Philadelphia area. And Michael Krauthammer was the father of George Krauthammer, who you met in the PBS featurette. We became friends. I visited him in um, New Jersey several times with his wife, Barbara. Um, they pulled all of their children up to Columbia. We had a picnic on, the, on Broadway, south of Columbia. Every child, all adults arrived more successful, more amazingly attractive than the previous. He had like six children. Um, he asked me to call him Gunther. And so having retired, at this point in his life, he wanted to regain the early identity. By coincidence, you saw the picture in the film, he was practicing English pronunciation. And that woman, they stayed friends all their lives, Peg um, Hannum, she convinced them to change his name to George rather than Gunther. And by taking back Gunther, he was saying, well, actually, I start out life as Gunther, now end life as Gunther. Anyway, this is um, Michael Krauthammer, a Polish Jew, his father. His mother, as you see later, was a German Lutheran. We might talk about Robert Burquist later. Um, he was a staff member at the hostel. It's sort of euphemistic and said sweetly, but heroic human adjustments, what does that mean? I mean, these people came, English was not yet the world language, it was still French. Um, in Europe, if you had a car in those days, you were wealthy enough to have a driver. So most Europeans really didn't drive cars. Um, and so these people arrived, stripped of their law degree or law license, their medical license, no car, very few had really excellent English skills. They had to adjust a lot. And so it all began. Verlin Pemberton was the farmer up the corner at Yankee Corners. It was his daughter, Lillian, who was on staff and later married George. Willoughby, the man I pointed out, who'd grown up in Panama, son of an American engineer working on the canal. Um, he was a grad student in Iowa City at the time.
John Kaltenbach, by the way, was only 23 at the time. Looks like he's 30 or 40. It, it could be the hat. Kurt Schaefer was the statistician from Berlin. He didn't even know he was, quote, a Jew, but the Nazis informed him that he had too much Jewish blood to be an Aryan. Kurt Rosig from Vienna, um, a merchant. Karl Gamm, a stateless Czech who'd been studying in Philadelphia. And during the Sudetenland disaster, he lost his nationality because there was no more Czechoslovakia anymore. And Fritz Troyer, a stationer from um, Vienna. By the way, footnote, you've heard of Anton Troyer at NPR, who's a Jivwa, is his grandson. Fritz's son, Robert, married a Jivwa woman, and they had two very handsome, successful sons who would have long black hair and, and feathers, and they're very much into Indian rights. So how ironic that you know they're half Jewish and half a Jivwa, and they have the name Troyer. So these people had indeed escaped this fellow, and now they were out of Hitler's reach in Iowa on the prairie. I would say it's not fully true. I've been living in Germany 30 years and I don't click my heels and I won't start. But when I meet people, I do sort of do that. And I realize with this quote, I said, oh, I do that. But in America, I never see people do that when they meet. Maybe they do, maybe you do, but I don't think I did until I moved to Germany. And I do do that when I meet someone. So right away, they were trying to get these people used to the idea, you're here, there are no servants. Um, one of the couples arrived and they put their shoes outside the door at night, as you would in a, a well-heeled European hotel, to be polished. And the Quaker staff laughed and said the next day, no one's going to come by and polish. You can polish your own shoes. So they handed the men a dishcloth and said, get to it, gents. This is a local, again, the Quaker pastor from the other kind of Quakers. We don't have pastors ourselves, but that's, um, look at the body language. I think for the local <laughs> folk, I think for the local folk, these, these are like Martians telling improbable stories that couldn't possibly be true of Nazis and camps and. Carl Gamm found somewhere a fiddle, violin. We'll probably talk about this later, but I first came to the Library of Congress as a young doctoral student in Berlin, and um, I was naive and being very politically correct and was basically gonna have the thesis in my dissertation, how these Quakers, and I am one, so I was being self-critical, these Quakers were taking away the culture of these people. And then I interviewed the people and said, kid, no, get over it. We wanted to lose our accent. We wanted to integrate. We wanted not to stick out because in time of war, if you go into the store and you order a, a, a pound of flour or a loaf of bread with a German accent, it's not gonna go well. They said, we wanted to fit in. We wanted to integrate. This is you know, what you're writing about is hooey's. I said, okay, I'll have, I'll find a new thesis. After dinner, the Europeans were scouring the newspapers for news of home and the war, since we're living in time of war again, you can somewhat imagine. So Heinz Lorry actually didn't, uh, from Hamburg, a merchant, he actually didn't come in what was called the Conestoga, that's the station wagon you saw in the earlier picture. He came by train like the next day. Um, and it didn't take much time before they converted these people from being Europeans to being Americans. <clears throat> and all these men with John Kaltenbach on Monday began to work. And why were they renovating the old school in April to make way in May for the first family? the Deutsch family from Vienna. Regina, Michael, and the children, uh, Emil and the children, Michael and Hannah. So the Deutsches had clearly 
seen the horrors of the Anschluss, the annexation, where Jews were forced to scrub the sidewalks of Vienna with brushes, sometimes toothbrushes. How do you explain that to your child when she says, Daddy, what's happening over there? And how long can you stomach that before your heart breaks to watch your own co-congregates being so humiliated? Orthodox Jews' locks were cut off in public in Vienna. Many Viennese Jews decided we can't tolerate very long and they flooded, the, here's the Polish consulate trying to get tickets out of annex Austria. Well, one of the families also came and said the Deutsches were the German family, the Seligman family. What's interesting about this is that um, the boy Helmut had actually been on the kinder transport and had gotten to England. I lived in 1981-82 in North Yorkshire. I went to a boys' grammar school, Skipton, um, in Skipton called Ermsteads, and I met many Quakers in Britain in the 80s who had been with a kinder transport. So Quakers don't proselytize. In fact, those among us who might even try, others would say, you know, knock it off. So these people were convinced they were often placed with Quaker families while their own families perished back in Europe. Um, there were a lot. So British Quakers were the largest group among the kinder transport host. They took in 10,000 children from Nazi occupied Germany, Austria, and from um, Prague. In fact, there's a lot of kinder transport Mädchen arriving in London by ship. And from Prague, there was this heartbreaking scene. And the agents who took them Again, the child minders. And the parents left behind at the Prague airport, having put on a happy face as best they could. Anyway, the Seligmans did reunite at Scattergood and Helmut came from England. The American Quakers tried to get a similar bill passed for 50,000, because we're America, we do everything bigger, right? So they're trying to get 50,000 young um, Jews from Nazi-occupied Europe. And the wife of the immigration service testified before Congress and said, well, 50,000 ugly Jewish children will grow up to be 50,000 ugly Jewish adults. The bill didn't pass. It was the family of the Weilers. Here's Rosel and the daughter Bertel, who was about six. And they had their own odyssey. The husband, Goose Weiler, a Jewish um, cattle merchant and butcher, um, he knew it was bad. And so he got a ship's passage arriving in New York from Bremen on the last day before World War II began. On September 1st, when the Nazi regime invaded Poland, of course. And his plan had been, I will save money and bring my wife and little girl on a later ship. Well, the war got so bad, they went east. They went from Germany to Vilnius, to Moscow. They then went to Korea and took a boat to Japan, a ship to Seattle, and a Greyhound bus to Scattergood. And a year and less than a week, they were reunited with the father and husband at Scattergood having gone the whole globe to their safety. Not all people had such fortune. There's Boris Jaffa, who was of Jewish descent, but he said his faith was um, Greek Orthodox. At any rate, he was from St. Petersburg, and he'd been in the Tsar's army, was captured as a German prisoner of war in World War I, and held in Stolp, which is now, I think, in Poland. It was in Pomeran, uh, where my mother's people are from. Um, in the 20s, he wasn't going to go back to Bolshevik Russia, he went to Berlin and he became Warner Brothers film distributor for Germany. 
and the Nazis hated him because of his Jewish ancestry and because he was, quote, peddling Jewish decadency from Hollywood, okay? So he left, same idea as Gus Feiler, the Jewish butcher. He's gonna get out his wife, little girl and two sons later. It didn't work like that. He's the one that what I said in the film 25 years ago, my, the good twin said that 25 years ago, he was the one who paced the hall at night and couldn't rest. And I don't know if he was one who so broke into the lottery and ate, ate food, I don't know, but they said he never rested. He was worried about his family all the time. And he finally thought he had it. Then the US Embassy in Berlin wrote and said, oh, sorry, we've lost the file. Can you begin again? And this is something, I mean, you live in this culture. You can ask me in the Q&A. There were codified policies to keep these people out of the United States. Oh, we lost your file. They didn't have photocopy machines. They didn't have telexes to fax the stuff hidden and yon. In my book, Out of Fitness Reach, we can find it on Amazon or eBay or something. We tracked some of them. They had to go to Stuttgart to cancel their insurance policies. They had to go to Hamburg to pay a tax to take the furniture out of the country. They had to, so the Nazis made it very difficult and melt them in the process. They had to pay all this money. And then you have hotel costs, you have to eat because you know the trains weren't as fast then, they didn't have ICEs. So this was a great system. It was a perfect economic Ponzi scheme. Take these dejected Jews and melt them for all your worth. And at the end, so in the early days you could take relatively quite a bit of wealth, but at the end, these people were lucky to leave with 50 Reichsmark. So he was gonna get his wife and children out, then we lost the papers. Um, I don't think so. It happened a lot. And what happened to his family? Well, anybody know what this is besides my German intern who's not allowed to say what it is? Oberstein. And it means? Stumbling block. And what is it? Limburg, Frankfurt, Hamburg, Köln, even our village of. So here, Bonte, some of you speak German here, resided, Tamara Jaffa. She was a little girl. She was arrested. They picked up the wife, the little girl, the two boys, and took them to Hermannplatz. Some of you, I used to live in Hermannplatz, and they processed them and sent them up Schoben. They deported them 10 days later to Istanbul. And why did Istanbul? They were traded in Turkey for Soviet-held Germans. So the Nazi Germans gave these Jews, and the mother was a Lithuanian Jewess, um, to the Soviet officials, but they suspect them having been Germified, then sent to the Gulag. Notice it says Soviet Union, you relaped? Hardly. The mother and the, and the two brothers, they had frostbite so bad so badly that they lost digits on their hands and toes. They had to cut off at some point the mother's foot. They all perished except for Tamara, the little girl. And then a British Jew living in the Soviet Union, I don't know what she was doing there. She found Tamara and got her to America. And by that point, the Quakers had found Boris a job at the shipyards across from Portland, Vancouver, Washington, in a shipyard. This is, this is the Gulag. And she was reunited with her father and she later lived here. She became um, Tamara Wall and she was a socialite and she never told anybody about any of this. But in the 50s and 60s, she became a big, you know, socialite and went to all the Washington balls. People amaze you. And of course, we all fall in love with this picture. Edith still is alive. I can give you her email address. She lives in Worcester near Boston. She was a lifelong teacher in the Boston school system. And when I met her in the 90s, she met me at Applebee's on the suburbs and she came with a bright purple hat. It was Bella Abzug's soul sister. I'm telling you, she arrived <laughs> with this purple hat. And I thought, what is this? What is this? By the way, the film really was, it really, it was really true that out of the 23 kids, all but two, her brother Lewis became a meat inspector, and then there was one that became a merchant, whatever, but all the other 21 kids, they all became counselors, teachers, psychiatrists, uh, psychologists. I mean, all of them became helpers in care professions. The older youth, he, um, Ant Solmitz was 17. He was also a young person, but and on his own. He was a little bit damaged. He fell in love with Camilla Hewson. 
who, who liked him, but flatly said, no, I'm not gonna marry you. And he proposed repeatedly. Notice then he changed his name to Summers. What was his trauma? His father had been a Jewish editor slash printer in Hamburg who had been in the Fürstbüttel um, prison, which is still there. When you live in a country like Germany, but there are other countries that have done very bad things. It's also banal. Maybe the bill is still there. You know, when you go to our town, Erfurt, where I'm a professor, um, you look from the Memorial Topfensona factory where they made the ovens for Auschwitz. You look from the um, engineer's drafting table, you can see Buchenwald on the hill. I kid you not. It's all totally banal, totally everyday, totally ordinary. Well, all of these refugees came, there were 185 of them, and they found what they needed at Scattergood, and then it was time for their departure, and here's a goodbye party. You know some of them from the stories. For example, um, let's start in the top right, the Stanleys. What happened to the American Gothic couple? Well, they actually, after this, retired and moved to California, as many Iowans actually did. Um, Martha Baldiston, you heard her husband was the one who had been in Rotterdam and saw the dejected Jews get off the ship. Sean Coppertorn was our Irish Canadian, unfortunately had a drinking problem. Um, Mary Eukartz, interesting woman, some of you have heard of her name, the Arbeiter Wolfart, um, the Workers Welfare Organization, which is quite an important organization still. And in the 70s, she was honored with a stamp in Western Germany for her work as a co-founder of the um, AVO. And today in Berlin, in the Reichstag building, where the parliament meets, there's a hall named for her. She was a scattergood. Nobody wanted her. The Jews didn't want to help her because she wasn't Jewish. She came from East Prussia, where she grew up. Finally, the Quakers said, we'll take her. She was 60. No jokes, I'm almost 60. So it was a different world then. 60 was more like a death sentence than it is today. At any rate, she spoke no English because English wasn't a world language. This, how do you place a 60-year-old woman on her own in a country where she should speak? What do you do with her? Um, it was like the, um, the Winklers, Jakob and Melanie Winkler, the Hillel House in Iowa City, next to the university took the Winklers. They couldn't speak English. They eventually ended up in Sioux City, the same community where Dear Anne and Dear Abby grew up, the Friedman sisters, all right? Also, um, Roosevelt's right-hand man came from that same community in Sioux City. So all these people had a fate. The ones that I'm drawn the most to are the Krauthammers. There's my friend George or Gunther. His parents, um, Michael in the bottom, the Polish Jew, the mother, Ellen Krauthammer, a Protestant um, Lutheran German, um, and the Schostals. I want to tell a little anecdote about the Schostals. So I became friends with these people, and meeting them changed my life. Walter had been the son, there were two brothers, I don't know what happened to the other brother, but they were a very successful Viennese photo agency. In those days, of course, newspapers, magazines, they all get their photos in hard copy. It wasn't, you could just electronically send them over, could you? So they had this really empire. And once my now ex, he actually gave me for my birthday a calendar of their photos. They were a very important middle European photo agency. His wife was Magda, a Hungarian Catholic. Anyway, they, left and got to America. It wasn't easy, and they didn't have a good time of it. But here's what I'll tell you how fate, how strange fate is. For whatever reason, the Schostals um, later divorced. In the meantime, he got a, um, a life in Westchester, very suburban, successful. They had a new photo agency in New York in the 50s, 60s, a lot of money. Anyway, they divorced. And in the 80s, he went on a cruise. He met this woman in Ilsa. And Walter and Ilsa had a dacha in Ottersee near Innsbruck. And in the summers, they would fly to Europe to be where they both came from. And I found out this story that in the Third Reich, she'd gone to Berlin and studied at what I called Humboldt, but it wasn't called Humboldt then in the Third Reich. And she studied as a graduate, I think, how to help German farmers settling areas taken Lithuania and Latvia from the subhuman Slavs and the Jews, and to use their languages better to have the slave laborers work more efficiently. Her whole job in her graduate studies paper was to make more efficient how German colonizing farmers could make the slave laborers in Eastern Europe work more effective through the use of the language. They, she was obviously a big, they meet in the 70s or 80s in a cruise ship in Greece, fall in love, and here's this woman married to a Jewish refugee, 
who was once a rabid Nazi. Fate is strange. And I'm quoting William Shirer from Iowa. You knew him. He was the one who wrote Berlin Diary. That's right. Again, the idea of the agricultural ideal, if industrial capitalist culture is bankrupt, then we'll help them at least have an acreage. It was the end of the depression, jobs were not laying around every corner. It was tough to get these people a placement, but still, So the idea was bring them to the Midwest away from anti-Semitism and from anti-immigrant hate, bring them to the American heartland and get them jobs. And they got jobs in Peoria, Milwaukee, Corning, Iowa, in the hotel near the, the train station. They got their first jobs there. Most of them graduated then. They drifted to Chicago at least, or if not New York, but this was the ideal. And to some degree it worked, but at any rate, while they were in the American heartland, And in closing, oops, sorry. A footnote that's American Four Square is called the Berkowitz House. I'll tell you about it in a moment, probably. If you don't have a piece of paper and pen, it's no problem. You can take a picture with your cell phone, or maybe I can get my new friend here to put this in a report about tonight's event. But those are uh, um, links to further information about the Scattered Good Story. You will all get an email with those links. <laughs> <laughs> and I will also make the video recording, and this is being recorded, as you can see up there, that little dot that's blinking in the green bar shows that it's being recorded. I will make that available as well. And, uh, if Michael permits it, he just suggested that the presentation can be shared. I would be happy to forward that. It's a huge file though, so. And the fact that it's being shared doesn't make me at all nervous or um, self-conscious. No, not at all. Um, no, no stress. In a moment, we'll uh, advance the last two slides. Are there any questions before we conclude our program? I'd be happy to take your questions. Did any of the guests from Europe end up in farming? <laughs> Touche, right? Um, 
There was a couple that did go to Israel or Palestine. I don't know what they did there, but I, it's plausible that they did, but probably not. Those who stayed in the United States, I don't think so. Um, that said, there was one, he wasn't a Jew, Hans Peters, he was a social worker, a leftist in Dresden. He left because the Nazis didn't like him and his politics. He did stay in Rockford, Illinois, and he married Doris, the high school friend of Camilla Hewson on staff, the girl with the lawnmower, and they might've been involved in agriculture. They were involved though with civil rights and they worked with integrating Rockford, Illinois' social housing, so public housing. Um, I should also mention, by the way, this, witness to social justice wasn't just among the staff. For example, George or Gunter Krauthammer, his first wife was black and so was his second wife. But in the 50s, he left Queens where, where the Krauthammers had gone to live and then went to Paris. He said, I couldn't stand the pressure even in New York in the 50s of having a black wife. So he was actually a teacher in France and Paris for some time. And then he had the second Af African-American wife and Barbara, the widow, I hope she's still alive, um, was actually white, but Quaker ancestors. And um, George, I was at Princeton last week and someone mentioned that he had attended a meeting there for a long time. Um, these people are deeply affected by the experiences. When we were with Ilse, the former Nazi and, and Walter at Ottersee, she brought in the mail that had just arrived. There was a letter from Scattergood School, had nothing to do with the hostel. After the war ended, they reopened as a, uh, as a school. And while we were talking, he pulled out his checkbook because they lived in America most of the time. And he wrote a check, a fat one, and put it in the mail and sent them a donation. So these people were incredibly grateful because a lot of them had gotten to New York and would go to some of these midtown um, social agencies buildings where social agencies tend to group together, especially Jewish, like Hyas and, and other Jewish groups. Well, they told me the story many times that they would start at one end of the hallway and go from office to office, and the first Jewish group said, well, you're too old, if their parents were 50. Or the next one say, we have too many children, they had two. Or you don't have enough money, or you have too much money. So the last Jewish agency said, go to the end of the hall, that's the Quakers, they'll take you. And they did. <laughs> so many of these people, they had nowhere else to go. It wasn't their first choice. Oh, I'll go to the American heartland. I want to be out in the sticks. Nobody did, Nobody was like, oh, yeah. Except, except that said, and Solnitz this renegade, so he was 17, his father was brought in to um, Fulbrettel really early on in the Nazi um, disaster, and they beat him, I think he might have even died, but he certainly abused his father. He left, he fled, came to Philadelphia, he met the Quakers, and he traveled out to the prairies. He spent time on Native American reservations. He went to the Hutterite uh, settlements, he was interested in that. So he was a young kid, a young German, it was 1934, 35, whatever it was, and he went in and he experienced all of this. And then when they found the hostel, they said, Ernst, do you want to go to our hostel? And he said, yes. He was a bit of a renegade. He was often in trouble. Later he became a medical doctor. Um, but even Sarah Stanley, our very reflective Quaker matron, said, Ernst, dear, make your words tender and sweet. You may have to eat them later. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Quick, quick mathematical one. Do you know the percentage of residents there who were Jewish and not Jewish. But two, the bigger question is in the featurette, it said that it closed in 1944 under the impact of the possibility that Japanese in American internees were gonna come there. Yet none came. So why was it closed? Yeah. If, there, if, if the people there remain all in your region. Bring up the second point in a second about, uh, in, in a moment about the Japanese American internees in the desert. So about the Jews, my best guesstimate, I'm guessing, but I'm not the dumbest, Bob in the pack. So using names like Grunwald, you know, they didn't say they were Jews, but come on, or um, others, Vice. So I'm guessing both from those who said they were ethnic Jews or practicing Jews, because they did, they had both. They had non-practicing ethnic Jews and they had practicing Jews. They lived in Steins, went to Hanukkah, Cedar Rapids with local families. I would say 85%. So if you have 185 people, 85% are Jews. So that's 100 and 30 years, I'm a historian and a mathematician. And I wanna talk about now, so some of the woke part of this. So first you had Oprah Winfrey's version with the PBS feature, it's lovely, we all cried, it was sweet. And then I just told you the social historian's version. Now I need to know some of the nuances. So there was a big dissonance between the Philadelphia Quakers and the Midwest Quakers. Remember, we were our own people. There were no freeways for us. New York might as well have been next to Moscow. 
and there was a big cultural divide. So you have these ur urban Philadelphia Quakers, you have the ilk, you're not that far from Philadelphia, then you've got these hayseeds, that's what we were. Um, and so the Philadelphia Quakers wrote to the Pembertons, you know, saw the farmer, the father of Verdon, and his daughter became a staff member. They wrote to the Scattergood Quakers and said, well, it's really nice that you're warming up the Jews in Cedar Rapids and Iowa City. They invited Rabbi Monheiber to come from Des Moines to lecture about the Jew, his past, his uh, present, and his likely future. I don't know if he uh, accepted the invite, but I saw the letter that he was invited. So the Quakers are trying to prepare the soil that there wouldn't be such an anti-Semitic reaction among the locals. The Philadelphia Quakers said, it's good you're doing this, but don't come off as coddling the Jews. We also know that later, uh, the third director's career, Martha Balderston, on her clock, there was a young um, Jewish woman from sh Chicago, Ruth Weiss, American born. She wanted to come and be on staff. She was there for the traditional weekend, long weekend or a week. And then they declined and said, thank you anyway for interest, but we don't think it's a good fit. And I saw the letter to the AFSC um, headquarters in Philadelphia. Martha wrote, it pained me to do so, but in the end, I had to make the decision based on her race. Okay. So first of all, the Jews are a race, which is interesting, but I had to make it because I had to turn it down because she was a Jew. So there's this dissonance. And now the woke lecture continues. Katja didn't know what she was booking. So um, mm. there's a problem in the hostel. The Berlin Jews called the Viennese Jews the Walzer. You know, they just want to sit in the cafes and, and have nice music and have a good life. The Viennese Jews called the Prussian Jews, I'm sorry, the Berlin Jews, Prussians, Freudian. So you have this tension between the Austrian Jews and the Berlin Jews, and they weren't the best of friends. They sort of held each other at a bit of a distance. And those two, in turn, they were not very friendly with the Russian or the Polish Jews. And now comes the next thing. Kasha's thinking, oh God, get him out of here. So mm -hmm. I, I had no mistakes because that's the way it is among the Germans too, and uh, the Austrians. And the Bavarians don't like the ones from the north and vice versa. But these are also truths that we don't want to recognize. I, I honestly, I know it's problematic to be a Quaker and be a Quaker historian, but I was looking for, as I said in an interview in Philadelphia on Friday, I was looking for residential programs. There were numerous day programs, highest in New York, and there were other Jewish organizations. They had day programs, or in London, and even the Quakers had day programs where they'd give you a needle and thread to put the button back on your tired coat you fled with from Berlin or wherever you fled from. They had day programs to feed people, like soup kitchens. But I was looking for residential, that the refugees actually lived around the clock and year round, if possible. And I found 13. Two were from governments. The British government had one, I think, Camp Kitchener down uh, by Surrey or Kent. And then there was a, an American camp, Camp Oswego, disaster. So America came very, the American government, those decisions were made here outside your door. Um, they decided to send Ruth Gordon, an American Jewess from New York who had studied German, I think in Munich or, or Cologne in the 30s. They put her in American uh, army uniform, or skirt, of course, sent her to Yugoslavia, and they picked up all these fleeing Jews. The war was almost over. It was like, I don't know, March of 45 or fall of 44. The, the war was almost over. So they found a few s stragglers, a couple of Viennese Jews, Hungarian Jews. They sent them to New York and, and then put them on sealed trains and sent them up the valley to near Buffalo, Camp Oswego, and put them in this, this unused army camp with children men, women, and then they sat, they sat, I don't know, until 47, 48, 48 46. I, I wrote this dissertation 25 years ago, I get a break, but I do know for sure they sat and sat and sat. They let the kids go to public school through the gate, but the parents couldn't leave. They sat behind barbed wire. Finally, a journalist from New York it went up and said, what the hell are you doing? These people were the victims of Nazism. They're putting camps in large part, and now we've got them at camp in Oswego. Well, Truman finally got off his duff and he let them go. Same problem though with the um, hundreds of German American internees at Ellis Island. They sat and they languished. They sat and they languished into 48 until finally Senator William Langer from North Dakota said, This is ridiculous. Got on a ferry at Battery Park, went out, had a funny, uh, 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 what do you call it in English? Uh, so, uh, Briefcase, had a briefcase, took out his stamp next, and he stamped all their passports and said, go home. So there were these problems that when the government would put people behind camps, they'd forget them. 
And Truman came and didn't know who are these people, and he just let them languish. This is part of the problem. I was pointing to this case because this is a model of a housing unit in Crystal City, Texas. It was an internment camp for Germans, German nationals, German Americans, Italian Americans, and Japanese Americans. They were rounded up from all over the country, they were even brought from Latin America. That camp existed until 1938, until December, sorry, until February 1938. So people were in there for years after the war ended. We would be grateful if you'd go to our website, trace.org. Um, I need to put here on the subset, our, our former homepage, you have to dig for it. It's under number two, historical case studies. Go to that page. That's our previous homepage. We then, after this story, did exhibits about the 15,000 German American internees for the 60 camps, North Dakota, Wisconsin. Um, the government had contracts with the Home of the Good Shepherd Convent in Omaha, St. Paul, Milwaukee. They'd put German-American women, the children, the convents. Anyway, it's not true that there were no German-American internees in World War II. That's bunk. Charles Grassley, my friend, who I ran against in 2016 from Iowa, honest to God, look it up. Um, he actually co-sponsored a bill with Russ Feingold, a liberal Jewish senator from Wisconsin who might be dead by now. Those two in the 80s were co-sponsoring a bill that Congress simply studied. What is this about German-American internees? Every time the bill made it up there to be discussed. Someone blocked it. They couldn't even discuss the bill on the floor of the House or Senate. Somebody didn't want the story told. Part of it, I'm told, is because MacArthur was involved. They didn't want it to look bad on his clock. But this is, prob this is problematic. All these stories that have just disappeared that we don't know about. Yeah, but again, that's great. You didn't answer my question, though. Why does scattered close? I did ask you to remind me, but okay, our cue, we have to work on our cues. So at the end, but she said as well in the film, so the war in Europe was getting so intense that the escape routes were closing. You couldn't even get to Shanghai anymore. You couldn't get to Cape Town. Some of them had got scattered, went through Martinique. They were in Cuba and they finally got away. The Bowers, um, Catholic Socialists from Vienna, they came through Cuba with their sons. So the war was so intense, basically no, no civilians were moving anymore. So the Quakers said, well, we as hostile, we could bring our own Japanese Americans. And it wasn't the Quakers who said no, it was the townspeople. If you get my book, which I hope you will, um, you'll read the accounts. They even brought a man named Diamond with his wife, FBI uh, local official from Chicago, I assume a Jew, Diamond, Diamond. At any rate, they came out and the Quakers showed them Scattergood Hostel. They dined with the refugees. They were very favorable. They went that night to the West Branch High School gym. It was like a bad B-rate movie. Um, and they're screaming people, you can't bring those Japs here. Um, our sons will hear about it over in the Pacific Theater. And they'll wonder, what are we doing? And Diamond said, well, I just saw the hostel. It's perfectly fine. So this is schizophrenia in time of war. We'll bring the Germans, white people from abroad, but we won't bring Japanese Americans who are mostly born here who are citizens. So uh, they, they, they simply cycled out of the. They had to. They didn't. Their hands were forced. The Europeans had cycled out, leaving it virtually empty because there were no new incomers. They, they, that source is dried up. Correct. Okay. That's the basic. Did you know about Scattergood? No. Um, and I'm a historian. I didn't know about the 15,000 German American historians. We had a mean professor from Yale contact our board and say there were no German American internees. If you go home or just now in the subway and Google at YouTube, Camp Crystal City, Texas, there's a Department of Justice film in color, bad color, grainy and looks like you know old paste. But 1946 or late 45, other camp, and you've seen the film, I assume. It's the government's own film, and they take you to Crystal City. But don't be hoodwinked, because the woman who narrates is Bernice Berard. And if you can stand a Texas accent, good for you, because I can't. Anyway, she narrates this, how wonderful the camp was, and they had their own hospital, and their own cafe, the Vaterland. So she tells you what a good, there's a gentle breeze off the Gulf. That's crap. I've been there twice. There's no gentle breeze in the desert. Anyway, <laughs> what she doesn't tell you when they get to the censor room, and the censor spoke German, Japanese, and Spanish. Well, you don't know because you're just innocent, well intended people. Watch it further. Then she says, and the Peruvian tailors, the Peruvian Japanese tailors, were allowed to sew suits and keep some of the proceeds. 
Why were the Peruvian Japanese tailors? Because we were kidnapping in Latin America thousands of Peruvian Japanese, over 2,000, a tenth of the Japanese Peruvian community I know because I spent two months in Peru chasing the story. We, we took out even Jews who fled Hamburg, got to Colombia, and we brought them to Texas. And why did we have these thousands of Japanese and German Latin Americans? Because we wanted hostages to trade with Tokyo and Berlin, and we did this. Patton's own son-in-law was a POW in a camp. The only time Patton violated his orders was to break out of the plan and go into a POW camp and save his son-in-law successfully. But I mean, there are all these layers that we don't know about. They were literally kidnapping people in Latin America and bringing them here. This is fact. This isn't, the LA Times did editorial about it based on our research. This, we have Jewish historians, I forget his last name in Florida. He documented Jews who fled the Nazis were being brought to Texas and sent back because they needed hostages to trade for Axis held Americans. Any more questions? Yes. Was the Stattergood community there or the area around it, the town? Is that predominantly Quaker? Predominantly, not exclusively. Hoover came from um, West Branch. And was Hoover a Quaker background? Yes, yes, very much so. His mother was a registered minister. She spoke often in meeting. Um, people are, are acknowledged for being gifted, and she was a, a speaker that she died, and his father, the blacksmith, Jesse Hoover, died. Um, we do know that staff at Scattergood wrote to Hitler, uh, to Hoover, I'm sorry, that was a party, wrote to Hoover and said, would you like to donate to the hostile project? But we, we don't have in the records his response, if any. But the, the Quakers did try to go to him thinking he'd be a great poster boy for our project. Any other questions? Maybe touch on the online Oh, can I you? Have a comment, if I may. There is an exhibit you may not know about in the Holocaust Museum that is a contemporary exhibit on what the Americans knew about what was happening in Russia and when they knew it. And that the Campus Vigo came up with that exhibit, Scattered the Film. It's you a wonderful, wonderful exhibit. When people in the U.S. and the government of the U.S. Are any of you on the board of the U.S. Holocaust Museum? Could any of you please become board members? I'll tell you why. Um, the U.S. Holocaust Museum sent out delegations twice to the Midwest to pick up the story. They sent Yatsik in the summer of 2008 during the Madoff affair. Is that the right time? And in the middle of negotiations, he left, got a phone call, and they sent him back to Washington. And then it happened again in the summer of 2016. They sent out two other collections people. They wanted to collect the whole. There's a lot of them. Those people gave us diaries and photos. And once again, nothing came of it. The Holocaust Museum knows about the story. They don't tell the story. I think we have a question here online. And uh, I'd like to give people a chance. Can I stop sharing? Yes. Um, to ask questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. Do we have any questions online? Any questions from the online community? Yes. I have a question. Um, I'm Miko yes. Huth here, and I just want to make a remark. Thank you so much for bringing this to light. You know, I must admit, I don't know that much about Quakers other that they're very hardworking religious people. And I just find in this day and age, whenever something is brought forth where some real goodness comes out of belief and, and what people are doing, it just really warms my heart. So thank you so much for coming out here and telling this story. The question that I had for you was, you, it was you or it was either mentioned in the, in the video or, or the PowerPoint that there were a lot of uh, um, uh, pictures that were lost, like glass pictures or something like that. They yeah. used to be on glass way back when. Do you think that had impact in, in I mean, would it have, would it have been easier to get the story out if those had survived, do you think? Well, this loss was, was only in 2016. It was a relatively recent loss. Oh, um, OK. And, and they were slides from a, a tray, a circular tray. We're hoping we can find the original tray in a storage unit in Mason City, Iowa. We don't know. But for now, they're lost. And this slideshow is only about a third, as far as the photos, of what we used to show. We had another amazing 60 photos of the refugees working the garden and they were you know, harvesting tomatoes for Heinz ketchup cannery 
in Muscatine. I mean, we had an amazing collection. Inshallah that someday we find them again, but for now, there's good as lost. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, back to your comment just briefly, and I try not to be too bitter, but you might even contact the U.S. Holocaust Museum. We'll be there Monday. She got tickets. I'm going to look at that exhibit for the first time. But you might ask them, because they know about the scattergo. They sell our book in the bookstore downstairs. Why don't they tell the story? They have a mandate from Congress. They get public money as well as private money. Why don't they tell the story? American Responses is totally incomplete. It doesn't tell the biggest grassroots response to the Holocaust from America. Why? I don't know. I do not know this. But twice they've come to the Midwest. I can tell you this, that they came in 2016. They met with the State Historical Society archivist, with the local archivist. They met with us. They met with the school director. We had the feeling they wanted to suck it up like in a vacuum and go back to the East Coast and present this great story. And we didn't go along with that. That's the only thing we can think of is we went like, oh, a B. But we don't know why they don't tell the story, but they don't tell it at all. Still is we will go. We will go. I believe you, but I'll still catch later. I'll still rumble. <laughs> Any other questions? Now, Camp, Campus Wico, who was who were held there exactly? It's virtually, it's POW. About no, no, there were about basically eleven hundred Jews who've been um, swept up at the end of the war. The war was almost over. Ruth Gordon went, and they went to former Yugoslavia. Well, again, it was Yugoslavia again, but they were trying to sweep together these stragglers and okay. brought them. To, it was a gesture, same like the Swiss. I was um, just after the first lockdown in Europe closed. June 15th of 2020, I was on a bus for Zurich, go to the uh, Swiss National Museum. They have a they have a exhibit about World War II. And then they say, oh, and at the end of April 1945, the Swiss let the Jews, the Jewish refugees come. Well, they should say, yes, we're hardly any left running. I mean, it's whitewashing. In in April, later April 45, Switzerland let the Jews come in. Well, Month what be? The war ends. Yeah, yeah. A little bit late. Any other questions? Yeah, sort of I'll show you again now. Yeah. Were those people classed as displaced persons, the DPs? Or was that a different I, I I understood it. In fact, they made a film, maybe it was a Hallmark film, about Ruth Gordon's. There's a name of a book. I think her name is Ruth Gordon. Um, I think they were refugees. They were Jews on the run, and they were in Zagreb and um, Dubrovnik or Split, but they were being swept up. You really should Google it. Her last name was Gordon. Maybe I'm missing her first name. Maybe it was a Ruth Gordon, but anyway, it's important. In the exhibit today that I saw, it said that they were, they actually came in not through the visa system, but through the Swiss Embassy. They were actually all brought in as a group to go directly to this camp. So they didn't go through. The whole thing is problematic. They, they were they were not even they were visitors essentially in camps. And, and, and then a, at the end of the war, they finally were granted immigration status. Yeah, but it, but initially and not let out, not let out of the barbed wire. I mean, this was the problem. Right. They were not let out. They were held captive. And they complained, said, "Would you let us out? We've had enough. The war is over. We want out." Other last questions. I have. Uh, a warning. Can we go back to the shared screen? Yes. Um, you should be careful what, what you do. Um, life might take over. I'll tell you how I came to the story. I didn't want to write this story. In fact, I didn't choose it, so it chose me. And it was the yeah. following. I had met a German nurse um, in Nuremberg when I was living in Czechoslovakia. I was a professor at a university there. I fell in love and um, I wanted to go and, and be with Wolfgang. And the only way to do that out of the first three months, you can't just be a tourist in the EU. You have to have a reason to stay. They kick you out. So I decided I'd become a phantom uh, student at Humboldt University in the former East. And so I applied to be a student. And they contacted me with a letter and said, come down and talk to us. I went down and there was a table with a man with hairy knuckles and big bushy eyebrows. And they said, oh, you want to do your 
diploma arbeit i said no i i went to I, I did my undergrad in iowa state no no and i didn't speak german yet and his english was really bad well you want to do your uh, magister arbeit so no i did my master's at, at goddard in vermont no no oh you want to do your doctor arbeit I said yeah i'll do my my um dissertation and they said oh well let us look at your master's thesis and if it's okay then you can you can write your dissertation why not i said thanks i went to leave and he said no we're not done i said oh yes what is it if we approve of this, what do you want to write about? This whole thing was a lie. I just want to sit in a cafe with an International Herald Tribune, international edition, and drink coffee. I didn't want to study at all. So I just wanted a stupid stamp on my passport. And I began to count the ceiling tiles. And I noticed that Niagara Falls had erupted over my forehead and water was just cascading down. And I was really nervous because they were going to realize this was just a sham, that it was just a lie and they'd you know, take away my... And then I remembered a, a light went off and I remembered this conversation with Robert Berquist in a lunch line at a Quaker conference in 1983 or 81. And he said something about Jews at Scattergood School. I, I said, oh, well, I've always wanted to write about refugees and Nazis who came to Iowa. I've, I've waited all my life to write about refugees. And it was a lie, of course. And he leaned across the table and said, really? And I thought he was onto me and I said, yeah, sure, of course. And he says, it's great. The World War II is my expertise. I'll be your advisor, your doctor project. <laughs> so I went home and both come at me the door. How'd it go, honey? I said, disaster. They didn't take you? No, they took me. And the man almost jumped in my lap, then got off the table. So I had to do something. So I wrote to Robert Burke, who was now a retired teacher. He'd been 40 years after the war, a history teacher, a social studies teacher at Scattergood. And said, Robert, um, there, were no, there was no internet. It was type letters, took you know, weeks of correspondence. Robert, I'm, I'm, I'm in Berlin and I, I, I want to do this research. Can you send me any contact with these former refugees? And he wrote back and said, kid, I don't think you understand. I wasn't just a teacher at the school after the war. I was a staff member at the hostel. He sent me 40 or 50 addresses and names and telephone numbers and said, here they are. They just had a reunion, by the way. So I, I already my first burden to, to over, over, overcome, I had enough cohort. It could be a Wissenschaftliche Arbeit. It could be an academic study. I had enough to compare. So I couldn't go to Dr. Fatter and say, oh, it's too my light. So I said, plan B. So I typed the most mundane survey. Why did you flee the Nazis? Where did you go? Where did you land? How did it go? And I thought correctly, they'd realized I was a jerk. And I think I poured my coffee over the paper and I copied it crooked and I put my breakfast croissant and I rubbed it in and I sent it off. Because the old days, remember there was a thing called envelopes and stamps. Anyway, I sent off 40 or 50 um, photocopy, we, we had photocopiers in those days, to America. And I thought, well, that's that. They're going to see that I'm a jerk and throw it in the... No. I got a thousand pages of diaries, letters, photos, um, ships, passages to America, even postcards to the hostel with Hitler stamps. And in the meantime, this Robert Burke was do-gooder. He goes to the archives in, the, in Iowa City and he says, Mary, by now my friend too, Mary Bennett, this kid in Berlin's doing research in Scattergood Hostel, do we have anything? And she said, well, I don't know, Robert, but let's look. And she opened the filing cabinet. I could hear it even from Berlin. And she found another thousand pages of inner office memos with the AFSC to Scattergood and the newsletter. Every month they published a newsletter and the refugees' English lessons were essays, how I escaped Warsaw during the bombing with my baby as a Polish um, social worker, how we got to Martinique and finally got so we went to the Caribbean to get to America. And this was all their records, how they, they wrote essays and the Quakers published them. Well, I got the complete set. So finally, after 2000 pages of this primary data, which is a dream of every authentic doctoral student, I said, literally, I said, okay, I'll do it, leave me alone. <laughs> the Berliner Senat, the city council gave me two scholarships in a row. I came to America in 90, or 95, and I interviewed 40 of these people in New Haven, wanted to become a sexologist at Yale. I was in Michigan, and I went Massachusetts. I was over the country, Texas, and I interviewed these people and found their stories, and I was so humbled because originally I went up the hill to the Library of Congress archives, and I was going to write about all oh, these well-intended but blind, culturally limited Quakers trying to take away the native cultures of these 
refugees. And when I interviewed them, as I told you, they said, get off that. That's, that's, not, that's not what happened. And it led me to what I did write. And um, you can get it from her, I hope, our link. The dissertation is online. I was the first dissertation of Humboldt to ever be online. I'm quite proud of that. I was a pioneer to the end. Um, and I compared 13 different, there were eight refugee centers from the Quakers, two from Jews, and three from governments. If you count one more on the Isle of Man, so there were 13, that's all I found, just 13. And here we are talking about it now. I'm thrilled for your interest. You're the ones who have to go home and tell to others that the story will live because I'm on my way out. Someday we won't be here. And if we don't tell the story, it will disappear. And we shouldn't let that happen. Thank you. And for anyone who's interested, just that. Thank you very much. And uh, also to our online guests, thank you very much for, for watching tonight. Um, we are recording this event. It's still running the recording, I hope. And uh, we will share that with you. We will make all the, uh, the links and the sources accessible to you via email. And uh, I look forward to um, promoting this through our website, um, GAM usa.org because i believe it is a very important story to share and uh it also ties into uh an email that i sent out our wow of the uh the month where we share our museum's treasure with our online community and uh this uh this month's wow was actually this little model that uh okay. those who are here in the museum can see um, standing there in the glass display case, and it is indeed a scale model of a housing unit at the uh, Crystal City internment camp in Texas. And that will go up on our Facebook page. And um, <clears throat> eventually when I get to it, because I'm only one person and I'm running everything kind of, it seems like I will also establish um, a presence for all those wows on our website, but please give me time because I am one person and um, I am web mistress, executive director, sometimes uh, cleaning lady, whatever else comes up, intern, uh, trainer, <laughs> There isn't a role that is too grand or too small. I seem to take care of it all. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, and uh, I hope you uh, have a lovely rest of your evening and uh, look forward to welcoming you again. Also goes for those who joined us online. Thank you very much again. Have a great night. Bye.